interest of time, we'd like for you to take your seat so we may begin the program. My name is Lee Stiff. I'm the Associate Dean for Faculty and Academic Affairs in the College of Education. And it, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce the Dean of the College of Education, Dr. Marianne Danowitz. Thank you, Lee. Well, as much as the food is good, I know that uh, the comments this evening are going to be very sustaining. So I too would like to welcome you and emphasize that we are here for the Don C. Locke Multicultural and Social Justice Symposium. I'm thrilled to see so many of you here and to support this important event and to honor and celebrate its namesake, Don C. Locke. Dr. Locke, was a professor of counselor education at North Carolina State University. And he dedicated his life to the advancement of counseling, diversity, equity, and multiculturalism. His life work and this symposium set the example for our college. Our purpose at the College of Education is straightforward. We want to improve education and we want to transform lives, schools, and communities across the state and nation, especially for those from underrepresented and underserved backgrounds who have challenges that they never asked for or brought on themselves, but came into the world facing them. We have embraced our vision to ensure the success of all across the lifespan and to do everything that we can to create socially responsive and inclusive communities. For that vision to, become, to come to fruition, we as a college and we as educators, counselors, and leaders must understand and engage proactively with the complexities of diversity and multiculturalism in society. And we must be intentional in preparing culturally competent professionals who embrace the commitment to equity and who will expand the opportunities for all people, especially those from marginalized backgrounds. While we know it is important to do this at any time, it is, I believe, at this time, both a moral and ethical imperative to do that now at a time when racism and ethnocentrism are unshamedly part of the public, of public society and the political and social discourse. Holding the Don Locke Symposium and hearing from experts like Dr. Moore and having important conversations around increasing the representation and success of black males in K-12 education, post-secondary matriculation, and completion are crucial to our being a college that actually lives out our mission and advances equity. These conversations, like the one tonight, are also critical to the well-being of individuals, families, communities, our state, and nation. So as we move into the program, I'd like to thank the steering committee for the Don C. Locke Symposium for all the work and passion that you have put in to making this annual event possible and for bringing experts and thought leaders like Dr. Moore. And I would just like to ask the members of the steering committee to please stand to be recognized. I would also like to recognize our special guest tonight and to thank Ms. Marjorie Locke for being here with us this night. Mrs. Locke, would you please stand? Um. 
your presence here today is a reminder to me of just how important these conversations and symposia are. You, like your husband, are holding our feet to the fire, ensuring that we stay true to our core mission as educators, leaders, and counselors to lift up others and champion the success of all in a society with a very uneven playing field. Now, it is my honor to introduce my colleague, Dr. Mark Grimmett, who will then introduce our special guest. Dr. Grimmett is a member of the steering committee, as you know, and he is an associate professor in counselor education in our college. He is also coordinator of the mental health counseling program and founder and co-director of the Community Counseling Education and Research Center, affectionately known and known to the community as CSERC, which provides free or low-cost, multiculturally competent counseling services to individuals and families in Wake County. His research focuses on preventing gender-based violence through education, activism, and also he does extensive work with transformative masculinity. He works on the promotion of healthy development for African American people in general and males in particular. He teaches and researches methods in social justice and counselor education. But Mark is more than an academic who's engaged in the community. He's also a filmmaker as a way of reaching those who might not necessarily read his published articles. Mark is the executive producer and co-director and co-writer of My Masculinity Helps, an educational documentary that exposes the role of African-American Ameri African men and boys to the prevention of sexual violence. So please join me in welcoming my colleague, Dr. Mark Grimmett, to the lectern to provide the introduction to our speaker. Thank you, Mark. That was very, very nice. Good evening, good afternoon. Very happy to see you all. I'm very happy to, to provide the introduction for our speaker today, Dr. James Elmore III. And before I get into the formal introduction, I'd like to tell you all how I met Dr. Moore. It was when I was a doctoral student, and it was over 20 years ago. And it was probably, probably the first time that I ever went to a professional conference. And I was walking around, you know, trying to figure out how things worked. And I saw Dr. Moore, and he had recently, I think, recently earned his PhD. And he had his CV, and he would walk around meeting people, introduce himself, and share his CV with them. But when we saw each other, we did, like, we're trained, and like Dr. Lott would have expected us to do as black males, we introduced ourselves to each other. And what I learned very quickly was that Dr. Moore knew everyone there. And he took me around and introduced me to everybody and took me on his wing. This is the first time we met. And that's been our relationships for the past 20 years. How I know him to be is very generous. He is the same with, I guess, students, little kids, high school students, undergraduates, as he is with university professors and, and presidents, because he has relationships with everyone. But he treats us all the same. He's generous, he's available, and he takes his time. Maybe that's because he's from South Carolina, but I never feel rushed when I'm talking to him. I feel like I'm the only thing that he's interested in in that moment. I think he makes everyone feel that way. So I love him for that, and he's been a tremendous mentor and role model for me and many people um, for a long time, just like Dr. Locke trained us to be. So Dr. James L. Moore III is the Vice Provost for Diversity and Inclusion and Chief Diversity Officer at The Ohio State University. He also serves as the first Executive Director of the Todd Anthony Bell National Resource Center on African American Male, on The African American Male. He is also the inaugural EHE Distinguished Professor of Urban Education in the College of Education and Human Ecology. He served as Program Director for Broadening Participation in Engineering in the Engineering Directorate at the National Science Foundation. 
He was also associate vice associate provost for diversity and inclusion at the Ohio State University. He's an internationally recognized scholar for his work on African American males. His research agenda focuses on school counseling, gifted education, urban education, higher education, multicultural counseling, and STEM education. He is frequently quoted and mentioned in popular publications. I'll just mention one, the New York Times, but he also has a local impact. I see the Spartanburg Herald in here, and I think that's really important because, again, he cares equally about the, the very well-known publications and his local place where he's from. He was cited by Education Week as one of the most as one of the 200 most influential scholars and researchers in the United States who inform educational policy practice and reform. He has co-edited five books. Just a couple are the African American Students in Urban Schools, Critical Issues and Solutions for Achievement, Black Males and Intercollegiate Athletics, An Exploration of Problems and Solutions. He's published over 130 articles, obtained over $200 million in grants and gifts, He's given over 200 scholarly presentations, and he's presented in the United States and internationally in Brazil, Bermuda, Bahamas, Jamaica, Canada, England, Spain, China, India, Indonesia, Ireland, where we're, the last time I saw him was in Ireland, and France. So I also want to mention that he earned his undergraduate from Delaware State University and his master's and PhD in counselor education from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. He was selected as an American Council on Education Fellow, an American Council and Association Fellow, and Big Ten Committee on Institutional Cooperation and Academic Leadership Program Fellow. He also has a key to the city of Spartanburg. <laughs> I mean, this is just, I love all this. So the last thing I want to say, and perhaps one of the most important things, because I've heard Dr. Moore speak a number of times, is that he's a native of Lyman, South Carolina. He's married to Stephanie Moore, and who is also from South Carolina. They have four children, James IV, Sienna, Savannah, and Sinai. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. James L. Moore III. Yeah. Wow, let me just say, it is a pleasure to be in your midst, in your presence. Uh, my brother and I would always say, when we used to, we, all, all my siblings and I went to school up north. That's what we say if you're from the south. And uh, as we drive down 95 and get on 85, we could always say we feel empowered because like, as we get over that line, we used to stick our hand in the car to see who could get in South Carolina first, right? Because it had medicinal power. It was something, it created a, it stirred up a disruption in me. And all that I am that I hope to be is shaped by that experience. I'm not from Spartanburg, I'm from Lyman, South Carolina. And so that was very important for me because no one knew where Lyman was, but I swore to myself that swan, someday they will know what Lyman, uh, know more about Lyman, South Carolina. I am so honored to be here and to be in the presence of the Locke family and touch their garment. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> also, uh, I would be remiss if I wouldn't thank Dr. Stiff for calling me. He sort of like became my new friend. Uh, when he called me to ask me to do this lecture, I said, of course I'm going to do it. And I said, you probably don't know this, but Dr. Lott was one of my mentors. Uh, when Dr. Grimmett was talking about 20 years ago, we were in New Orleans. And everywhere I went, I, was, I didn't know I knew my name, but I was the black guy with the bow tie. And I found that that was very meaningful because they couldn't remember my name. I wasn't important uh, at that time, but they certainly knew that I was the guy with the bow tie. And Dr. Locke would just 
just come in every time he saw me talking to someone, he said, you better hire him and you better pay him. <laughs> and if you know anything about Dr. Locke, but I want to um, also thank my mentor, Dr. Harvey. Dr. Harvey, I was so shocked to see him here, but I've been very blessed they, to have the kind of mentors and individuals and sponsors in my life. And not only were that many of them were black males, they reflect the spectrum of humanity. And they've invested in me in tremendous ways. I had a great aunt who used to dip snuff. And I know you don't hardly see women dip snuff, but she was truly a South Carolinian. South Carolinian. And she had the most beautiful teeth I ever seen in my life. And I don't know how you could dip snuff like her and have the kind of whiteness in her teeth. But she would always say, one day, boy, you're going to have something to say. And all my life, I've always wanted to have something to say. Because where I grew up, kids were to be seen and not heard. So hopefully, Aunt Pat, today, I'll have something to say. But I want, I would be remiss, this morning I got up really early. I'm an early riser, I get up about 3.30 every morning, I'm a true country boy. And I wanted to find the last email that Dr. Locke sent me. And I would like to read it to you because no matter what, he was always following my career, just like Dr. Harvey is following my career and always giving me a nugget of support and encouragement. So Dr. Locke sent me an email on Sunday, September the 22nd, 2013, at 9.19 AM. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, at 7.11 PM. He said, James, I just received Phi Kappa Phi form today because he was an avid reader. And he said, I saw the brief spotlight on your ACE fellowship. Hope all goes well with you. It seems that all I hear about you is good. And I'm glad and pleased. Remember the old saying, quote, I knew you when, end quote. Cheers, Don Locke. Then I, I responded back to him because I'm an early riser at 919. I said, Dr. Locke, because you wouldn't dare call him Don. He's forever Dr. Locke, even though he said call him Don. But we just couldn't find the words to say Don. He says, Dr. Locke, I said, Dr. Locke, good morning. It's always good to hear from you. You have always been an inspiration to me. So I'm glad I got to tell him that. And he heard it from my own mouth. Right now, I'm leaving the, leaving the Congressional Black Caucus Conference. I was invited to serve on a panel, which went very well. On another note, I was recently made the EHE Distinguished Professor of Urban Education and received one of the largest single gifts in my college's history. More specifically, I had a donor give me $700,000. God is so good. See the link for details. Take care, respectfully. And he responded back, and this last one, I won't. He said, well, shut your mouth wide open. <laughs> I thought you were going to is a line from the musical Perlai, and is appropriate for my behavior. My emotions are elation and pleasure. I'm so proud of you and proud to know you and proud that you are among the youth in our profession. Yes, God is good for you and to you. Keep up the good work. Peace. That is Dr. Locke. That's Dr. Locke. So I am glad to be here. Can we turn this down a little bit? So I'm glad to be here. And today I'm going to talk about a subject matter that is so dear to me. It's personal. And I remember when I first got into this work and I wanted to do research and wanted to improve the educational status for young African-American males. And people would tell me, why would you want to waste your career on an endeavor that you continuously see a spiral the decline? There weren't many resources at the time. At that time in, in the 80s and 90s, people were 
using terms about endangered species. That was what they were used, using to describe the status of young black males in America. And so where I grew up, we always say, you know, what is it that you can do rather than expecting everybody else to do something? So I began to develop a career in this endeavor. And I remember when I first developed the research agenda, it felt like I was in a room like this and I was sharing my findings, but the findings were just coming right by that people were numb to the fact that we were losing young men Throughout the, all, throughout the educational pipeline, elementary, middle, uh, elementary, secondary, and post-secondary levels. And so I, for those who are young graduate students and professionals, I can tell you I was just minding my own business, trying to do good work. And for some reason, someone, my career, began, a groundswell occurred when there wasn't any resources in it when people didn't think, didn't know what was gonna come out of it. And so today I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of my own research. I'm gonna kind of share some of my uh, Southern experiences because President Clinton say it's nothing like a good story. So I'm gonna weave my story within this and some of it is not my personal story, but the stories that I, um, I will share from my students. So how many have actually seen some of these popular publications? And basically, this is the one that stands out. I think this came out in 2004, and it talks about the boy crisis. And see, what people don't know when you look at, when we were started to keep census data on graduation, matriculation and graduation rate, it was in the late 50s. And when you look at the census data, African-American women are the only group within, compared to their male counterparts that have matriculated and graduated at a higher rate than their counterparts for nearly 100 years. White women pass white males in the 80s and they're not looking behind. If you look at all the groups within, women are doing better. I don't know about it in North Carolina State, uh, but if many of our large public universities disproportionately, there are more women in the universities than men. I predict in the next 10 years or so, and I'm not saying I'm asking women to take a back seat, because they're not gonna take a back seat. They're gonna continue to drag us. But what I am saying, I predict in the next 10 to 15 years, the new affirmative action will be males. And some people look at me and they would, would say, are you kidding me? But in the UK, they began to explore this. If you do a Google and look at the status of men in China, they're concerned about the status of men. In China, they will self-destruct because of some of the policies that they had. And young boys are underachieving and low achieving at a very high level in China. Some of the things that you see in the UK, you see it white males are not performing at the same level as their female counterpart. And many of us have become numb to the fact in this country that black males just not gonna perform at an optimal level. It's not only a social justice, I know our symposium focus on social justice, but in Ohio we understand and other places around the country, we understand it's not just a social justice issues, it's an economic imperative that we begin to invest and improve the quality of life for so many of these individuals. And because when I was at the National Science Foundation, I began to see things even more clear than I did before. It's because the federal government is continuously investing in those populations that tend to be fragile, not performing optimal. Because not just because it's, not, it's a moral imperative, is because we want to maintain our global edge as a society. Many of you all probably don't remember in 1983, the Hudson Institute produced a report called the Workforce 2000 Report. And it said pr almost prophetically, and some of the things that we're seeing happening is occurring, it said the new worker would be made up of women, ethnic minorities, immigrants. 
And right now, after September 11th, it affected some of our immigration policies. In turn, if we continue to go the direction where we're going, not that this is a foreign policy about immigration, it's further uh, suggests that we even need to focus on groups like what I'm talking about today. So, as you can see within the groups, women are doing better than men when you look within the groups. Native, white, black, even Hispanic. Issues that we're not necessarily focusing on. And, but many of the things that are happening is much more complex than what people think. It's not just one variable. It's not just because the teachers are white. It's not just because they don't have parents at home. It's much more complex than how people easily articulate. There's a report at the New York Times of uh, 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 economists highlighted, and I knew this, but sometimes people need a tune-up, is that when you really look at achievement gaps, the achievement gaps suggest that the $100,000 black family and the $100,000 white family, the gap is wider than just low income. But in America, we feel more comfortable to talk about class. But the report that was in New York Times suggested African American boys, even when their parents are upper and middle class, they're less likely to live, to have the same kind of social structure as their parents. And it makes sense to me, and I'll explain some of this to you uh, as I begin in my, this is just a prelude, so I may ask you to do some sit-ups in a minute to make people laugh. There's a proliferation of research around the country. More people are doing more work around examining differences between females and males. But I don't think we, we, it makes any sense to say whose plight is any worse than the others. Because right now we're in a state that we have to really improve the lot for all of our Americans. But this presentation is because my work focused specifically on black males. That is what I'm highlighting. So I don't want to walk away here and people think I don't recognize the plight of other people. And I do research on other groups too. So national data show that there are differences between males and females in the matriculation and even in some of the STEM areas. African-American males are underrepresented more than their counterparts in advanced academic programs, and they tend to be overrepresented in special education. Um, maybe about five reports ago, the Schott Foundation, they did a study and they looked at the state of special education in America. And that report highlighted that over 100,000 black boys were placed in special education erroneously. Now, if you put somebody in a curriculum that they don't supposed to be in, uh, do I have any counseling people in the room, students? So okay, I promise you I'm not gonna quiz you on a, something you probably should know. How many remember this scholar named Clifford Beers? Clifford Beers was a person who wanted to reform psychiatric hospitals. And he just thought America did it really bad. And so as a result, he pretended like he had a mental disorder. You raise your hand, you remember? And, and what he said, what the findings were, even if you didn't have a mental health disorder, if you hang around people enough, you begin to act like you have one. If you put people in curriculum that they don't, they begin to look like they're supposed to be in there when they don't necessarily, and I call that educational malpractice. We have some students, I, I do a lot of work on gifted education, and we have some students who have a disability, and one of my doc students is emerging as one of the leaders in this area. You have some students who have a gifted identification or a tag, but they also have a disability. But disproportionately, low income, 
and males, particular males of color, they don't get the twice exceptionality tag. They just get the disability, the special education. So there's a lot of malpractice going on. So among whites, women surpassed men in the bachelor degree completion, as I said, in the mid-1980s. A larger portion of white men completed college than women from 1940 until 1980. Less than 1% of the black men earned a college degree in 1940, compared with less than 2% of black women. So this is a study, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but it's talking about socially disadvantaged students who are academically successful. But the whole gist of what I want you to walk away with is it's kind of like a theme of this talk. It's talking about they wanted to look at education aspirated teacher belief that students can do well in mathematics were the strongest student and school factors, respectively, when you look at it. Education aspirations uh, aspired to complete less in the college to aspire to it. That's what it means by education. Socially disadvantaged students in grade eight who aspired to a master's or doctor degree had up to eight times higher odds of being resilient than those who aspired to less than a college degree. Teachers believe that students can do well in their mathematics. So the socioeconomic students in Ager who agreed that their teacher thinks they can do well in mathematics had up to five times higher odds of being resilient than those who disagree. For black males, they tend to be more affected by how they perceive the student perceiving their capabilities. And so I did a study in 2003. Well, it came out in 2003 in the high school journal. And we wanted to look at what variables impact education aspirations for high school students. And we looked at locus control, cognitive ability, uh, students' perceptions, how the teacher perceive them, students' perception, how the school counselor perceive them, and cognitive ability and income. The perceptions impacted education and aspirations more than any other variable. Even when my family has the money, I still, if I believe that teacher does not think I have the capabilities, it affects whether or not I think I can do it. But other racial groups, it, the teachers don't have the same kind of impact on them. Who do you think are the ones who tend to have the impact on other students, other racial groups? Who tend to be the most influential person? For Asians, let's say Asians. Parents, for white students, parents. But for African Americans, it's not the same. And people say, well, why is that the case? Why is that the case? Let's make it, I'll come back to that. So, another story. No, no, let's see. Let me go to another. Is that, yeah. Yeah, this is the other study. So, who believes in me? The effect of student teacher demographic Mac on teacher expectation. It's well documented that teachers are important sources of information for students, especially for students of color. Using a national represented sample, you know, the L, we use, I use NAILS, they dropped the N, but this is NAILS 2002. A recent study examined the systematic biases of teachers' expectations related to demographic match between the student and teacher. What the demographic match mean that a black teacher and a black student, a white teacher and a black student. That's what they call a demographic match. So the data set includes two, two teachers reported expectations for each student's ultimate educational attainment. One demographically match, one demographically mismatch. The researcher discovered that non-black teachers or black students had significantly lower expectations than black teachers. The effects were even larger for black males and black teachers. Now, this is a pretty common theme that you will find. Uh, it was similar to my study. So I do a lot of work on gifted and talented work. Now, why is this as important? People say, well, why are you studying gifted? Because most people don't really, gifted does not mean necessarily high achievement, even though people use that as an entertainment. Gifted is one of those labels, it's a tag that uh, the federal government has outlined, each state has their own. The federal government gives you guidance 
and each state has their guidelines to qualify for gifted and talented services. And you can go in predominantly black school districts and you still will see underrepresentations of black males in those programs. Even when the teachers are black, you see underrepresentation of these students. But as you can see, when you're poor, you have, there's a lower participation. Now, I didn't, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that, but you know why we don't have students in gifted and talented programs? Because the, the Council of Great City Schools commissioned me and my colleague to write a paper on gifted and talented students. In some school districts, you can't even be in gifted and talented program if you miss days in school. In some programs, you have to submit an application and you have to do it online. Now, I'm, I'm naming some of these. In some school districts, if your parents don't come, if your parents don't participate in PTA or um, meet with the teachers so many times, they can't participate in gifted and talented programs. So we have created structures that makes it very difficult. And much of our educational system is middle class oriented. It doesn't even factor in, like my dad was a laborer, he sometimes who had to work third shift or second shift. It doesn't even factor in those kinds of things and having multiple levels of how do we engage the teachers. But I wanna go to kind of highlight so these are the 20, 20, this is part of that paper that we did. These are African-American males and gifted in 20 of the largest school districts. But what I really want you to do is to focus on these. This is the percentage of African-American male gifted and talented students as a percentage of the total enrollment of those in gifted program. And this is a percentage of them as it relates to the number in the school. As you can see the numbers, are very low. And Hillsborough County School District is pretty diverse. We know Houston Independent School District is pretty diverse, right? Chicago, look at Chicago. Now, now one of the things you have to be cognizant of is though the students may be predominantly black, in many of our urban school districts, does, it does, does not mean that the teachers and the principals reflect the population. There are only a few school districts, large urban school districts, that the teacher or the personnel reflect the student populations. And I tell people, in most of those school districts, unfortunately, the states took over. Detroit, New Orleans, Washington, D.C. Those are the three. So because it's urban, it does not mean so. Anyway, as you can see, here's Prince George County, supposed to be the richest African-American community in the United States, suburban community. And you still only have 8%. So it doesn't matter whether you talk about, and if I look clo more closely in suburban schools, the numbers are even worse. If my colleague Donna Ford was in here, she would probably say we're still trying to desegregate advanced academic programs in America. So these are some of the many factors. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these, but as you can see, I talked about perceptions. But many of our young men, this is what I found, this is what I focus on that I'm gonna also talk about today. Absence of opportunity to develop appropriate work habits. That's what advanced academics give you. I have a study in the Urban Education Journal that my doctoral students probably, it's usually, it's one of the highly solid, cited pieces because it's one of the rare pieces and we studied urban students who 
we asked them about what we wanted to know, did they feel like their K-12 preparation prepared them for college? Boy, it was educational math practice that could make you cry. Because some of the students, even though they were in the top programs in their schools, they took everything that their schools had to offer. But unfortunately, oftentimes, it still wasn't enough. And some of the students even articulated that the class, of, when they took their calculus class, some of their students, their peers, indicated that they had that book in high school. And that was how our opening it was. Uh, but this is, at minimum, as my colleague Chance Lewis would say, to right some of the wrongs in, in every state, we should mandate that every school in the state of North Carolina and South Carolina, but they did their, their recommendation in Louisiana, because the report was in Louisiana, that every school should offer the minimum uh, requirements to get in your state institution. Some kids just don't have a chance to get into North Carolina State because they live in a rural or urban school district. And that's fundamentally, for me, is wrong. Absence of challenge in school. So these are some of the family kinds of issues. We know poverty does not mean you can't perform and think at a very high level. Because I have some students who come. We have a program in Ohio State that's in my office. We celebrate in 30 years. We graduate over 1,000 first-generation college students. We're, it's probably the largest pipeline program in the United States. We have about 1,500 students. We guarantee you admissions, regardless if you score zero on the ACT. And we have staff in each of those cities. We're in the nine, eight, nine urban areas. Eight are the, some of the largest urban areas in America. And we guarantee we work with you all the way into the ninth grade until you get to Ohio State. We've graduated over 1,000 first-generation college students. And then not just first-gen. Everybody like to throw all first-gen does not mean the same thing. <laughs> we just assume you can be first-gen and still your, your parent, your father is a postmaster and makes over $100,000 a year. You can go and live in PG County in Maryland that your father or mother may work for the U.S. Department of Education or the Department of Commerce and make $100,000 a year. So it's not just that you know, all first, in first generation is not the same, but the students in this program, about 85% of them family expected contribution is zero, and then the other 15 is less than $500. So many of these students, not all these students, they come from not just humble beginnings from chronic poverty. But it does not mean they can't perform at a high level because we send them to the top med schools, law schools. But it's to educate people who are um, not getting a quality education, it costs a lot of money. And so not only that, the trauma that students experience in some of these communities where it's violence and crime. Some of my students talk about who at Ohio State They'll tell me that they saw one of their friends, you know, get injured. And where were the counselors and the social workers when you go to schools like that? When we think about Columbine, which was, that was a horrific event, where they spent 20 something million dollars to redo the school so kids won't be reminded of that horrific act. In America, we have, when you're poor, sometimes it's pretty darn crummy. Not crummy because they're not worthy. It's because sometimes we just become numb of the fact that some people need more, not less. Social and community factors, hostile environment, negative peer pressure. But this is one that you see in these spaces. And a lot of research is emerging around boys and, the, and how we educate them. And we don't connect with some of the energy that they, I, I travel around the world and I just came back from Brazil and I go to schools and I wanna learn how other countries do it. Cause everybody like to say cause someone poor, but how we not can go to Africa or some of these places, these kids still are able to do certain things. And I just, it's just mysterious to me to some many ways. 
And it's like, are we just kind of making excuses that that's the reason when there was a part of this country that it was mostly poor and we became one of the top in the world because we made a commitment? One of the things I learned in America, I wasn't born when the Sputnik was launched, but I read a lot about it. We tried numerous times, but when Russia beat us, it wasn't, we didn't have a U.S. Department of Education. We had a Department of Defense, and they created the National Defense Act, and they funded school counselors. That's why we had a proliferation, and they said, we're going to beat this, and we're going to do outdo, because we were so terrified with Russia. It's amazing today, I'm sure my grandparents are rolling under the grave, how we think about Russia today, because that, that wasn't the Russia that my grandparents knew of. Uh, individual factors, confuse or unrealistic <laughs> aspirations, problems with unstructured time. When I say confuse, and some of these students, it's amazing, and this is the anecdotal, but it also plays out in some of my research in many ways, is that students opt out of so many different things because they've never been exposed to it. If you've never been exposed to something, it's hard to be interested in something, right? And in institutions like North Carolina State and Ohio State, we have a rich history of exposing students to things. That's why we got extension. That's why we have 4-H. Because we know in some of these rural communities, sometimes kids don't have access to opportunities. And when they have access to opportunities, they have a greater potential to reach their potential. But these are some of the things that we see play out, common psychological, even when you have the capacity to do well. Unfortunately, black males are often seen as a part of a group rather than the individual. So I'm a jokingly, hopefully my wife is not watching, but if she is, I'll lie. But I'm gonna use my own life as an example. My wife just think I write book reports. She don't really understand the the, 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 the intensity of the papers that you write until she didn't really appreciate some of my work until the teachers start messing with her son. Her son, right? And to the point, then she wanted to read some of those intense book reports, <laughs> right? Because it was her son. No one didn't see James the fourth's mother and their father, they saw James. James was a part of a group rather than an individual. Nobody's seen that James is on track to be an Eagle Scout before he's 15, which that's really good. Nobody knows that James has been playing a piano since he was three and a half. They see, they didn't see Curious George. They saw what I was, Dennis the Menace. But guess what? It's the same behaviors, but it's how you describe them, right? How do you meet and connect with that? But anyway, that's the Moore household. So the stigma and inferiority follows many of our kids, and we're unconscious of it sometimes. we unconscious. In America, I can't stand the way we, why do we get so consumed that that kid got to walk in a straight line, and I was in Indonesia just sitting there watching the kids. And if you've ever been in, it's a very rigid culture in Indonesia. It's a Muslim society, and it's very teachers. It's not a lot of talking in the, in the classroom. But when them kids get out of that classroom, I see a boy over there tackling somebody. They out there wrestling in the hallway, and I'm looking around. I'm just kind of looking. Nobody's doing anything because you got to release that stuff. And, and now, if you ain't walking in that straight line, you, can't even, you don't even want to teach the kid because you're frustrated by a straight line. How do we create school systems to adapt to kids rather than expecting kids to adapt to us? You know, that's what we need to think about. Most of the problems I find with the young men that I talk about is usually an adult problem, not the kid problem. It's either the parent, it's the teacher, it could be a combination of things, but no one has ever asked. Another cycle, the invisibility syndrome. One of my mentors, Dr. A.J. Franklin, he coined this term. And how many read the highly acclaimed Invisible Man? I used to teach language arts. 
And if you ever read Ralph Ellison book, it says, I am an invisible man. I am a man of substance, flesh and bones, fibers and liquids. I might even be said to possess the mind. I'm invisible simply because people refuse to see me. They see my surroundings themselves or thickness of the imagination. Indeed, anything and everything is up me. I remember that because I had a Lithuanian Jewish professor. I was a football player in college. I didn't read the book because I didn't have time. And she embarrassed me when I did my presentation. And I said, I'll never go in front of Dr. Gold's class and not read the book. So I went back and read the book, and I just remembered the book. But she was the best professor I ever had in my life. Uh, black tax, you go in these classes, and you probably say, why that student don't, he should be in that class. Why won't he do it? It's because when he go in there, he's by himself. And he got, when you're talking about subject matters, and you just say, oh man. And guess what? It's not limited to the younger student. I have students who are adults who tell me this, that they feel fatigue, right? And fatigue affects you. It affects the possibilities. It, it makes you not even want to try. Now, I remember when I was a kid, and I used to say, oh, I want to go to school, this school, mom. And my dad said, no, you got to go to this school. Come on, and you just want to no, know you got to go to this school. And they always had to do a lot of coaching, right? So stereotype threat, prove the wrong syndrome. How many here proved somebody wrong before? So tell me what you had to do to prove somebody wrong. All right. All right. All right. Well, well the, we celebrate that. But sometimes we don't know the energy you put into proving someone wrong rather than proving that you're right. And I did a study, and that's what sometimes you can get so consumed with proving others wrong that you forget about why you even here and what you're there to do. And it has psychological, emotional effects. And some public health talks, of, some public health scholars talk about the John Henry effect. Yeah, you won, you achieved it, but it ain't without psychological and emotional stress. I did a study with my doc student, we, and we're working on it, and it's, hopefully we'll get it done soon, that some of our doctoral students are thinking retrospectively and saying, is it worth it? Is it worth it, right? Uh, now, Dr. Students, we want you to finish. It is worth it. <laughs> it's worth it. It's the best job in the world to be a professor. So these are some of the manifestations that we see. And I'm not going to read them all out to you, but just think about them. And I'm sure in some form, you've probably seen these things play out. And you're not even unconscious of it. You know, provide less constructive feedback. Now, one of the things that I would not want to be a teacher with dealing with Stephanie Moore. She's the kind of mom I'm excited about, but I wouldn't want to be a teacher with my wife. She just told me today, she briefed me today, that she doesn't talk to the school counselor. If that school counselor don't respond in the manner that she wants, she will be taken off. That's my wife. And you know why she's like this? Nobody ever asks why is, why do parents bring that to the table because she has an experience that she has not rid herself of. And because of that, she said, never will this happen to my children. She will spend every dime we have. We will eat pig feet and pork and beans and sardines. I know you all don't eat that in North Carolina, because we're the original South, we're the original Carolina. 
place a larger number of African and low ability groups, question the high performance of students on assignments. I have students. What people don't know, I'm sharing some of these, but I'm also giving some nuggets because I know I don't have a lot of time. At Ohio State, when I first became the executive a director of the Bell Center, we probably had about 200 and some African American males with a cumulative 3.0. Now nearly 50% of our undergraduate students on our campus have a 3.0 or better cumulative GPA. Now, people look at me, I say, it's very few universities in the United States with that kind of effort, right? Because you have to change the way sometimes young men think about themselves and their approach. But listen, I run a center that focuses on African American males, and I just thought about this just now. I remember I was coming to Raleigh. I don't know why I was coming to Raleigh, but I was on a plane with somebody from Charlotte. She was an executive person, big time executive. She lived in Raleigh. And I knew she wanted to talk, but I didn't want to talk that night. And somehow when you're a counselor, people want to talk to you. I don't know why. And so, to make a long story short, which is totally different from where I grew up, we don't ask people what they do for a living, that's not what we do, but I learned that's what we do in these higher circles. And I'm sitting there and she said, well, what do you do? And I said, I'm a professor. Where? Then, you know, this kept going. And I said, I run a center and I study boys and, and she opened up and started, Caucasian woman. Most of the phone calls I get from a center that focus on black males are from white families. If I didn't tell them who I was describing, they think I'm describing their child. That he's smart, but I can't get him to do his homework. He's brilliant. She sent him the, the best schools in the $50,000 boarding school, but he just wasn't motivated. And she was just trying to find, because one thing about moms, I'm not saying dads. Dads eventually say, you, he just got to leave. <laughs> right? See, see, if you were excellent, your mama probably did something to get you there. <laughs> right? But dads, if you look at it, they provide a lot of structure in some kind of ways, but they ain't going to do a lot of talking. You know? But anyway, I just thought I would share that. So, these are important attributes for scholastic achievement that I found. Strong internal locus of control, realistic aspirations, having strong support systems. And this is important regardless. This is very salient in the literature. A degree of maturity. Maturity is important, and it's not just emotional maturity, it's career maturity, right? Career maturity. Positive early school experience, strong soft skills. These are things that I did when I was at NSF that I realized what was some serious issues. It's important first and foremost, and this is the work we do at Ohio State and it's a major part of my work, being a counselor. I got in counseling not really for the career development aspect because I watched so many people who were not happy, not functioning optimal, because they were working jobs that they just virtually hated. That is quite painful to work a job that you hate. So interest is critical. How do we get young people interested in things? But equally as important, how do we sustain their interest? When I was in NSF, we kept saying, we want more women and underrepresented groups to go in STEM. And I was like, yeah, they got PhDs, but we didn't sustain their interest. They don't want to work in the field. Something happened, a disruption happened. The next thing is preparation. Preparation. A person's degree of readiness for specific academic and personal endeavor based on education and training. So many young people are not getting the adequate preparation that they need, and preparation goes beyond just the academic, what take place in the classroom. There's a degree of engagement that is important, and some students just don't have. 
So my son, he doesn't know it. The summer, his mama didn't decide. She said he can't write. <laughs> and so he's going to be writing to no end this summer. Right? He doesn't know that, but I didn't say nothing, but I know it. <laughs> experiences. How do we make sure that students have experiences that is indicative of their trajectory? Right? And sometimes they have experiences that are, do not reflect their trajectory. And oftentimes we'll hold students ex responsible and say they're incapable when they've never been even exposed to the materials. Connections, a person's degree of access to mentors and interpersonal networks, social capital. Now, let's imagine concentric circles, the boomerang. I know Dr. Stiff, and Dr. Stiff is in the middle of the boomerang. I'm in the outer ring. I'll forever stay in that outer ring, but because I know him, he saw me, he gives me a temporary access to see what it's like to be in that inner ring. And because I get to see what it's like, the lifestyle he has, how he communicate, because I'm always blown away when I go to major events and I see the students. I can tell the students don't know what to do with those forks. You got two forks, you got two knives, and you're looking at it, and then they bring chicken, and they, and they want to grab it, but they don't want to grab it, then they all of a sudden don't get, they're not hungry anymore, right? Because they're just trying to watch, right? And that impacts engagement. Anxiety impacts engagement, right? Connections, how do you build those connectivity? I've had sponsors. I believe I got this job because I'm an introvert. So how many here, let me ask this question. How many think it's more about who you know versus what you know? Raise your hand. Who you know versus what you know? Raise your hand high, don't, you know? Okay, all right. Now, what if you don't know nobody? You got to know, right? What if you don't? I can tell you from my perspective, I would not be at North Carolina State. I wouldn't even have a chance if people didn't think I know something. Knowing something gives you an opportunity to be able to connect with people. As I tell my students, I just came from Brazil, I have students in Ohio who never even seen the ocean. When you grew up in South Carolina, I get to go to the mountains, I get to hit the East Coast line. Some students ain't never been on a plane before. I have some students who live less than 15, 20 minutes from the university and never step foot on our campus. Ohio State, if you ask them, they say, we're going to Ohio State. But it's more of a figment of their imagination than anything. So connections are critical, opportunities. But your, whether what determines whether or not you're going to be able to access, sometimes you can give people opportunities, but they can't access them because they don't have the preparation, because they don't have the experiences, because they don't have the connection. So what we focus on a lot and I, at the center is how to get people connected to their interests, because when you're interested in something, you become self-regulated. You don't have to motivate me to come to Ohio State. And it could be, and like I said, I get up so early, I got, a, I got presidential parking. Because nobody's going to be up as early as I am. And I, when I'm walking to my building, they haven't shoveled the snow. So I don't messed up with several shoes. I'm going to have to hide these shoes before my wife to see them because the salt done messed up my shoes again. And she says, next time she's going to buy me some cheap shoes. Self-ethical theory, what I'm always talking about, I want to spend a lot of time. Sometimes you see in K-12, a lot of people want to dress up young men, which is important. I understand that. But what is the most important thing I focus on is achievement. Achievement increases efficacy more than anything. If you look at Bandura's theory, achievement. Most people spend more time on vicarious learning experiences. Some, everybody says why a young person is not doing well is because they don't have a mentor. There are some people who live in households 
that the parent, they got mentors, but the kids still don't, uh, not motivate. They still have no efficacy. Mentoring, the carers learning experiences do increase efficacy, but achievement, attainment, increases efficacy more than anything. So we focus on achievement. Social persuasion, we say, let me go talk to this young man. And you just say, okay, he, he seemed like he got his head on. Anybody had a, got a, had a son, nephew, brother? You talk to him, you think we're on the same page, and five minutes later, well, we, it seemed like we didn't, nobody, he didn't understand what I said, right? And then the physio physiological, you know, you got this feel, you know, you, you hear uh, John F. Kennedy speak, and you motivate it but it has no sustainability until you can get some degree of achievement. So competence produce confidence, but confidence don't produce confidence. I mean, competence produce confidence, but confidence don't produce confidence. It's important that students have some kind of skill attainment. Because I don't care how much you tell somebody they can do something. If they don't have the skills, they will not be able to do it. Skill and will. Everybody say skill and will. Some kids got the skills. Some individuals have the skills, but not the will. Now, we see fundamentally what I said earlier I want to revisit. I have doctoral students. And I'm in counseling, and counseling typically have more women than men. And you could be, I've seen this pattern. Okay, let me back up before I get that example. How many have been to a PTA meeting before? So who's normally doing all the writing down? Mom or dad? So you all have seen some of the same things I've seen. Now, how many have seen the notes of boys? What's the, what are the differences in the notes of young men versus young women? What is it? Thoroughness, what else? Need, legibility, actually took it. That's the main thing. That's the main thing. If you ask them, I got it, or, or, or they bring this. Now, we laugh at that. This is what we say. These kinds of things are the biggest threat to their success. These kinds of things. When the women come in, my PhD students, and I don't have a lot now, I'm trying to not take any more anytime soon. The women will come in, pull out their notebook, or pull out their laptop, and they say, Dr. Moore, do you mind if I, I, I take record this? I say, sure, no problem. And they still taking notes. Then they took the notes, they want to make sure everything is okay, they get home. What do you think they do when they get home? They're going to organize them, but they're going to send me an email. And what do you think that email is going to say? It's going to say, Dr. Moore, you said to do these things. Did I miss anything? So now they got everything documented now. That's a good doctoral student. Now let me give you an anecdote of the men. And this cuts across race. The men may come in. They're smelling good. They got a suit on that look better than anything like they walked out of sacks. Shoes looking good, shiny. And they saying, uh, Dr. Moore, you're a hard person to catch. You know, they got to shoot the breeze. I'm listening to them. I'm kind of like, what, what is it that we want to talk about? And then I help them. And then I'm looking around. I do my little counseling look. And said, what, what, what? I said, you ain't going to write this down? Oh, can you give me some paper? No, that's the one thing. Another thing is, oh, I got it. So they go home. What do you think they do when they go home? They'll send me an email, but they're going to ask me the same thing I told them 
face to face. Now, you all, I'm saying this in a joking way, but this is stuff that I see play out. And I see it play out what people don't know. Some of the, in the gifted education literature, some of the biggest underachievers are not people who don't have the ability. These are the people who never learn these kinds of skills that are essential for success in college. So skill and will. So these are some of the things. Behave, you know, behave as if you expect all African American males to achieve at a high level. Actively work to remove barriers for their learning. Teach these African Americans how to help themselves. So what we do, a third of our African American males on our campus, they participate in an early arrival program. It used to be three days, two days. I mean, one day, two days, then we went three, now it's two days. It's some of the high, our retention rates are anywhere between 92 and 98%, right? A third of them. We bring in about, uh, it's nothing to celebrate. We bring in about 130 to 150 African American males a year. And the numbers are dismal across, when you look at flagship and state institutions, some places got less than 500. Now, some people say everybody's playing football and basketball. That's what it looked like. But at Ohio State, less than 16% of the athletes are black but they play the sports that bring all the money in. Now, when you look at some of these kinds of things, you know, how they play out, the young men, what I learned, this, we do an exercise. I say, hand me, because I had an NSF grant and I studied, there's a term that I use called time on task. And so I teach the students about time on task. I say, how many hours, the, we had a question, we had a qualitative, we had a survey. We say, how many hours do you spend study from Sunday to Saturday? Seven days a week. Not count homework. These students were microbiology, engineering, physics, computer science, all the STEM areas. The qualitative, the males were studying four hours a week. The quantitative, they were studying five hours a week. The social science research suggests Asian students study more than any group of people in the United States, over 40 hours a week. Now, we'll make people smart. I'm not suggesting they're not smart or any group of people. But most likely, the more you do something, the better you're going to do it. If that's not true, then don't, then we need to stop, Nick Saban need to stop coaching. Because he does, the, he, I'm, if you ever watch a good coach, they do the same thing every week to the point that the coach don't even have to tell you to do it. You're programmed to do it because they keep practice, repetitiveness, repetitiveness, trying to get better and better and refine, right? So we work with students on that. We teach them how to study. We teach them how to engage. And we tell them that good students don't ask for tutors when they're failing. Good students get the tutor before they even go. It's a change of a paradigm of a mindset. Not only that, we compete. We bought a wrestling belt. Now, you all laugh at this. But these guys, some can't walk and chew gum at the same time. But they're smart as everything. But they want to they get that wrestling belt. So this year, and we, we focus on four things, because my goal is to get a Rhodes Scholar. Right? My goal is that, but we got two Rhodes Scholars. We just haven't received the last two Rhodes Scholars at the university. We got a Rhodes Scholar this year. We had one in 2016. They're the first two. Rose Scholars of Color in the History of the Universe, they come out of my office, right? The capability is there. But one thing I learned that you find from me, you will never be able to do something if it ain't a goal. If it ain't a goal, you're just probably not going to achieve it. 
And at first, when I used to say, we're going to do these things, people would roll their eyes and say, who does God think he is? And now when people, most people don't know that nearly 50% of our young men on campus got a cumulative 3.0 or better. It's not many universities in the United States. I don't count these schools that only bring five people in a year. Because they get, I'm not going to count some, and I won't say the school's name, but you can think of those places that you only bring four or five people in a year. Teach African American men and their family how to access support systems for academic success. Now, I found in college, even though I had to tell some moms that I don't wash clothes for the young men, because some of the moms are afraid because they never let help their young men to develop those soft skills. Because if you don't know, you can't manage your life, um, it will impede other aspects of your life. If you don't know how to wash clothes, you know, it's going to be a problem for you. If you don't know how to do certain things, and we work with the young men, but what we do, we put them in pods, but not only we reward those who get the highest GPA, we give them $2,500, the top graduating senior a year. And these students, you'd be surprised how they want to be bestowed the top graduating senior. Our athletic director and his wife give us $5,000 a year to give to the tutor. And we focus on four things. Because we believe if you have these four skills, you should be able to probably do anything. But we don't want our students just to be successful in their careers. We want them to be the leaders in their careers. We focus on leadership. We focus on scholarships, scholastic achievement, because your parents didn't drop you off so you can just barely graduate. Your parents drop you off so you can have all the opportunities you want. The third thing is service, and the other one is character. And we focus on all those things. I'm about ready to close out. Challenge the existence of low-level and unchallenging courses. Organize community action to promote support structures for high standards for African-American male students. Help parents in their community organize efforts to work with schools to improve test scores and academic achievement. Work as a resource broker within the community to identify available resources to help these students improve their test scores and performance. Closely monitor the progress of students. What we try to do, we provide success coaching, and we want our students to perform optimal, not just. So we like to believe, even if you come in as a 3-5, with the coaching that we provide, we can get you up to a 3-7, 3-8. Uh, one of my students just sent me an email. I got four young men who all just got accepted in the same medical school this year. And what people don't understand, they're all friends. And we have a saying that iron sharpens iron. We also have a saying, the ethos of excellence. It's the pursuit, it's the drive, it's the motivation. Whether you achieve it is yet to be determined, but that's what we aim for. Struggling African men need to be provided academic support, such as tutoring, study skill. But guess what? You, you raised the question. You can offer all the resources you want, but you got to be willing to use them. And for these students that we get at North Carolina State and Ohio State, many of them, not, they didn't need, some of them need tutoring. They didn't know what tutoring is because they could do well enough without it. And sometimes you have to change the way they think about themselves and their craft to say that the ultimate goal is to be the best that I can possibly be. And if I have to do that, that doesn't mean that you're less than. In many ways, it means that you're more than. Let's see, I'm gonna keep going because I'm about to close out. Cause I'm, no, 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 no. I wanna get this. Um, create bridge or early rival programs to help African American males smoothly transition into the African American male, uh, first, into their first year of college. Our, our early arrival program with the young men, we don't focus on remediation. And I'm sure many of you all remember when you were in college, you say, look to the left, look to the right. That person is probably not going to be here. We tell our young men, look to the left, look to the right. That's the best man in your wedding. That's your business partner. That's the person you're going to have your regalia on. It's kind of changing the narrative. And we have several of our young men. I had four who finished med school at the same time 
uh, the top law schools, the top business schools. Um, basically, I stole everything from Morehouse, and now Morehouse called Ohio State. <laughs> Provide resources and strategies that promote academic excellence, develop students' personal, professional, and leadership skills, initiate the mentoring process with current undergraduate students and faculty and staff, in our early arrival program, Ohio State is as big as you want it to be, but if you have connections, it's a very small place. And so we get, on the summertime, we invite faculty to meet with our students. And not only that, they have relationships and cards and individuals that they can call upon. Uh, but then what we do, we spend on those two or three days trying to encourage them to be willing to utilize the resources and build solidarity. This is a part of the Bell Center. Uh, these are some of the doctor students that we've had. He's in medical school. He finished, med they're all doing their residency. These are lawyers, PhDs. So if I had 53 PhD, JDs, MDs, persons of color, women, and when people say we can't graduate them, I tell them that's a lie, come to Ohio State. 53, so if I ever get sick, I've been good to them, I'm gonna have the best health care. <laughs> if I need a good lawyer, I got a boatload of lawyers. I got one student who just, his name Philip Ayo, Ayo, and Philip just finished his MD, no, he's getting his MD in the spring and he finished his PhD last, spring, or last fall. So PhD, MD. This talent is there. You know, Dr. Travers is in here. He's a Bell Fellow. And uh, so we try to create a community of scholars. And these are some of the places where some of the scholars are working around the country. Um, I close on that and I entertain any questions. I guess we don't have, oh, you have a question, okay. Okay. She's talking about her son. Oh, okay. <laughs> Give up. Well. Okay. Those of you who raise your hands. How many here took a parenting class? How many? One, two, three, four. One dad. One dad. I took a parenting class and I thought I knew everything, right? But my wife made me go, right? But I wouldn't have went if my wife didn't make me go, right? And so in America, we leave parenting up for chance. And when you don't do it right, we demonize you, right? So dads, and I don't mean to be, try to generalize, IQ is highly correlated. This is IQ with father's income and mother's educational attainment. The more educated the mom is, typically the better the student. Income, because men still make more money than women. And mothers tend to do most of the enrichment. If my children do well, 
they better thank their mama. They may throw me away. And that, now I understand what my dad used to say about himself. Like, you all are just probably throw me in a gully. You know, but it's your mama, she going out in paradise. Right? But, but when you watch sports, who do they rant and rave about? There's only two black males in America that they talked about their fathers more than anybody. Who? You know it. Right? But there's a role for fathers. And usually, I'm not, I'm saying based on some of the social science research, fathers provide structure. Not to say moms don't. Yeah, yeah. Well, it all, you're pretty good, but we, but when you well, I, I will, I will, again, I, I'm not going to talk about everybody else's household, right? I'll use my household as the test bed. Is that my wife will say, James, I'm not going to tell you again. I'm just in there watching, read, trying in my office, trying to work on one of those book reports that she has reduced to nothing, and I'm listening. James, 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 James. And then, did you hear me, James? And this is what I tell families: It's not to beat up on. The teacher is not going to say six times. So my wife always say, why do the kids respond when you say it was because my dad was blue collar and he did not want to say anything. He taught me to do the bow tie one time. He taught me to do the necktie one time. He taught me how to drive a car one time. He don't do two times. So I knew that about my dad. He don't do two. But guess what? When he had a daughter, he do five times. He do eight times. He do 10 times, <laughs> right? But with his older son, that's just, you know, people tend to do operate. There's a yin-yang, there's a benefit. 87% of the men who are incarcerated, they don't have a dad in their life. 87, I didn't say black males. I said 87% of men. Men, there are skills that you've developed, but sometimes I don't want to demonize moms. Uh, because moms who are raising kids, they're doing the best that they can do. Uh, but also, my doc student just did a study, and we were studying um, those who have been engaged with the penal system, and she missed something in her data, and I said, did you notice this? It's not that you have a dad in your life, they gotta be engaged. And these young men, some of them got involved with the penal system where their dad lived in the same house with them but their dads weren't engaged in their lives. It was just kind of like they let them come, they didn't provide the structure that they need. You know what? With young black males in the school and males in general, I'm, let me speak broadly here, the teachers who get the most out of them, men thrive in structure. But it, who are in the, how many here studying to be teachers? If you learn anything from me, you take away, Young boys thrive in structure. Structure doesn't mean that I'm saying you get in line, you do this. You have a formula for your instruction, right? You manage the class. First of all, if a kid is rambunctious, you don't let the rambunctious kid sit in the back of the class. People look at me and say, why wouldn't you do that? Because everybody's going to be looking behind the class. So you have to manage, and the only way you can manage your class and you understand the student, you have to be invited, you have to learn more about them to be able to respond. And sometimes you have to give kids permission. When you have one of your moments, just feel free to stand up or to feel free to go over here. 
and give kids that moment because if I don't let you all out of here, you're going to start walking out. And you, you all are adults. And sometimes we don't adapt to the kids. We want the kids to adapt to us. Wow, that's a good question. Well, um, some of it is people, they know when resources are not plentiful, people begin to not to make the same kind of investments that they normally did. Um, when resources are plentiful, people will put money in it. The reason why we did what we're, let me just say this, and the reason why I stay at Ohio State. To me, I'm not saying that there aren't great universities everywhere, but I've probably been on about 50 different university campuses over my life. What we do do, even though we're, we have our own flaws, is unparalleled what other places do. And when I say that, we've been in diversity inclusion since the 18, late 1800s. We were number one for African-American PhDs in the 80s. We dominated. Nobody could compete with us. You know, when you say some of the first, if I start listing some of the people who graduated, I look out my window in my office, which is a historical building. I see the, a marker that say Underground Railroad on my campus. So it has rich font. Reason why we were able to do it is because we brought thought leaders together, and they said it was a problem, and they wanted to take it on. Because Ohio State, in their mind, they want to be the world's land grant. We want to solve, we want to solve deep, serious issues. If you want to look at public education, UVA is for a public institution. They have the highest graduation rate for black males in the United States. University of Virginia. And I've been trying to understand why, yeah, right? Now, I live in Northern Virginia. And if you ever been in, anybody from Northern Virginia in here? No? So, so this is the difference. George Mason always toots its horn, say it has a very minimum graduation gap between blacks and whites. But most of those students, you know where they would come from? Northern Virginia. So it's a difference. So let me unpack some things to say how things play out. In Virginia, you may be on free and reduced lunch in Northern Virginia, but it doesn't mean your school is under-resourced. In Ohio and North Carolina, broadly speaking, maybe not in Raleigh, it means your school is under resourced if you're on the eastern shore, if you're in western North Carolina, right? In eastern North Carolina. But in Northern Virginia, it's class arrogance and intellectual snobbery. That even when people say that's not a good high school, and they, if they go look, that's one of the top high schools in America. But it's just not one of the best in, in the area, right? To me, I, I evaluate schools differently. See, my, my, my wife is now finally reading some of my stuff. A good school for us is the education that our kids get. Because you can send your kids to school X, and you think they get a world class. Now, now I don't pick on families. We have 1,400 students that we fund on our campus. 1,400 come out of my office. Now, all of them are not persons of color. They look like everybody in this room right, the way our diversity is. 
And I tell people, I've seen parents spend a lot of money on their K-12. It looks good. I've seen some kids go to some of the poorest high schools in America. And some of those kids outdo those kids who went to the best schools in America. But the irony of it is, if we didn't have certain programs, the kids who went to the poorest school in America wouldn't have never got a chance to go to the school to show that they can compete. I got a young lady who's a first generation uh, student. She's in Cambridge working on her PhD right now. And she's from rural Ohio, right? But people would have overlooked her because of the school she went to. And so fundamentally in this country, we got to get the school and right in this country. But I think fundamentally, at the core of it, we don't have will. There's no will to get it done. Now let me say, I love Ohio State, and I didn't go there. But I recognize they're only going to give me so much money to do what I need. But I also realized from working in D.C. public schools and working at being a K-12 educator, some of the failures are not money. What is what I see in schools? Because I had, I had a contract with the governor in Ohio, 33 of the worst performing schools in the state of Ohio. I always joke, I'm saying I'm probably the only one in the on Ohio State campus who know much about those schools. It's a decline of caring in these schools. We have people who work in schools that they wouldn't even send their kids to that school, but they work in that school, right? So these are some fundamental deep, but they'll say, I'm in there because I want to help, but they wouldn't send their kids to that school. Parents, we have to understand how education fun is, how it's developed, it's middle class oriented. It's designed for middle class professionals. It's not just middle class working people. It's middle class professionals. And when you don't fit that trend, uh, you create many challenges for so many young people. So anyway, I thank everyone for my time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I've been asked to um, introduce Don Locke's wife and widow, Marjorie, and I want to do that. But I just want to take a minute first, for those of you who didn't know Don Locke, to give you just a little bit of context here. Um, and it's easy for me to do because um, I taught here for 12 years. I arrived in 1983 to join the faculty of the, what was in the School of Education and Psychology. Arrived at the same time as um, uh, Dean Stiff. And when we arrived at North Carolina State um, to join the faculty, Don Locke was the only African-American faculty member in the School of Education. Uh, and he'd been here for several years, and he had pushed the institution to honor its um, ideals and to be more inclusive and more participatory in bringing people like myself and Dr. Locke in front of uh, the students who, who were here, who were at that time, and still largely white students, because he thought it was important for them to have an opportunity to engage with people who were different, to learn from us and to help us learn from them, so that this whole idea of multiculturalism and social justice in America could be realized. So when you leave this world, there are two things that you leave behind. You can't take anything with you. But you leave behind, hopefully, legacy and family. And so we're here today to celebrate Don's legacy, and it certainly is appropriate because everything that he stood for I think is, is, are the things that we all stand for and hope for, both at this institution and in America. But uh, more importantly, you want to leave behind family so that they can carry on the kind of things that are important to you. And, and Marjorie certainly has done that, and, and has, as have Don's two daughters as well, one of whom is with us today, Regina Locke. And let's have her stand up and be recognized as well. So Marjorie is going to carry on Don and her um, 
the, the ideas and legacy that they stand for by making a substantive contribution, um, a contribution of finances. She's going to support a student in uh, Don in her name who will continue to work here at NC State to promote the cause of multiculturalism and social justice. And uh, I think in doing so, uh, this is the best way in which you can maintain the legacy, the, the recognition, the realization that there are some things that, we all, that are worth fighting for that all of us ought to be participating in. So I, I'm so pleased that NC State uh, has started this program. I hope it will continue. I hope it will be well supported. Uh, not only by the School of Education, but across the university. And uh, again, the way that Marjorie and, and Regina and the family are supporting it with their own resources is an example to all of us. So without further ado, let me ask you to welcome Marjorie Locke to the program. Thank you, Dr. Harvey. And I'm, before I do what I'm supposed to do, I want to especially thank all of you for coming out today. It is such a thrill to see you. Some of you were here last year, and some of you are here, Tom and uh, Michelle, for the first time, Cheryl and George, and others. Um, and before I do this, one special person I want, no, first I must express regrets for my daughter, Tanya. She could not be here today, but she is with us in spirit and uh, regrets that she could not be here. And before I do what I'm really supposed to do, there's one person here I want to introduce. This is a young man from Asheville. He was a student at AB Tech, I think, when my husband met him. Since then, he has completed his bachelor's degree at UNC Asheville and is now uh, in a master's program in business at Lenore Ryan. So Brandon Keister, would you please stand? Brandon drove all the way over here from Asheville. He was one of Don's special mentees. Uh, I didn't know Brandon that well at the beginning. And Don would talk about Brandon and um, that he was having lunch with Brandon and he was encouraging Brandon to continue to hang in there. And since uh, Don has died, Regina has become the little Don. <laughs> so Brandon, we are so thankful that you came over here. And I hope you benefited from having been here. Okay, my responsibility is supposed to be to present the um, Multicultural and Social Justice Award to two people in the Counselor Education Program. Um, I think it's very fitting, and Don, I think, would be quite pleased with this uh, because one of the things he valued most was education and good education and that people get, were properly trained for the roles that they would play later in life. Um, he believed in the work from the Counselor Education standpoint of counseling people, mentoring people, and making people comfortable enough in themselves to perform in whatever way and in how, whatever position they found themselves in. So I'm sure, I don't speak for him now. I'm not, I didn't speak for him before he died. I don't speak for him now. But I'm pretty sure he would be quite pleased uh, to know that uh, uh, this symposium is continuing, and I hope it continues to, continues to go forward until we no longer need these. That's the utopia we're looking for, when we no longer have to pride people into looking at social, to multiculturalism and social justice. But until then, I hope that we will be able to continue this uh, symposium. So, at this time, I will ask uh, Whitney McLaughlin to come forward to receive the first award. <laughs> if you just stand here, to the desk. Whitney McLaughlin is a doctoral student in the Counseling and ed Counselor Education Program who works daily serving communities with the greatest needs that disproportionately include people of color. As a licensed professional counselor, she has extensive experience working in mental health services, particularly with diverse 
and marginalized communities. Her clients over the years have predominantly been people of color with low socioeconomic status. She is helping marginalized and privileged clients develop relational skills to discuss issues of power, privilege, and oppression. And she knows how to advocate and remove systemic barriers experienced by marginalized clients within social institutions. Among her professors, she is known for being a critical thinker, an engaging presenter, and an effective writer with a strong command of counseling competencies related to multiculturalism and equity. And, oops, and so, Ms. McLaughlin, it is my honor and privilege to present to you North Carolina State College of Education Multicultural and Social Justice Award to Whitney McLaughlin in recognition of academic excellence and for making a contribution in the areas of diversity and equity. Thursday, July, March 21st, 2019. And it's signed by Dr. Marianne Danowitz and Mark P. Lott. Congratulations. Thank you so The second person to receive this award is Karima Midget. Karima's not here. I'll put the talk to Stan. Had to leave. Shame on you, man. Okay. The second award is will be presented to uh, Karima Midget. Karima is a doctoral student in the Counseling and Counselor Education Program, known for advocating for people who come from marginalized communities and children who have experienced toxic stress. Currently, she is a clinical mental health therapist, working with clients from diverse backgrounds and worldviews. Previously, she was a high school counselor with the Wake County Public School System for over 11 years. While in those positions, she worked to increase student success by identifying potential barriers. Among her professors, she is known for having a strong commitment to multiculturalism, equity, and advocacy, particularly as an advocate for those with adverse childhood experiences. She is working on a manuscript that has been submitted to a professional journal and it is currently titled Adverse Childhood Experiences, Supporting Students Who Have Experienced Toxic Stress. In this manuscript, she provides strategies that school counselors can use to identify and support students who have encountered toxic stress. And so, <clears throat> Dr. Grimmett, would you please accept on behalf of uh, Karima Midget this award, Multicultural and Social Justice Award. Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. Let's give a hand to the two awardees. And I want to thank you all for coming, and I should also say thank you for staying. And I want to give a special shout out and thank you to Dr. Moore for his presentation. We truly appreciate it. As someone who is in STEM education. Please excuse me, but there was one other person. That's Dr. Moore. Now, Dr. Moore, this wasn't sure I knew him, but I did meet Dr. Moore many years ago, some years ago in Chicago, when he was working with Don at Upward Bound and all that. And so it's a delight to see some of Don's young prodigies performing for him. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to wrap up.
but I have a few statements and comments to make, so please indulge me. Of course, I want to uh, thank you all for being here. As I said, I want to thank Dr. Moore. This is a very important activity that we've engaged in in the College of Education. We certainly want to thank the college and Dean Danowitz in particular for supporting us. And I want you to know that I'm so happy to announce that uh, Marjorie Law, in support of this symposium, has pledged to establish a fund or an endowment on behalf of the symposium of $50,000. Of course, as she indicated, the fund is going to be used to provide ongoing support for the symposium and to ensure that we continue to bring thought leaders like Dr. Moore to us here on campus at NC State. And she said that she hoped that one day this may not be necessary, but in the, in the interim, we want to make sure that the symposium thrives and we hope that you will help us do this in that regard. We're going to announce, of course, that the uh, Endowment will be named in recognition of both Don and Marjorie's contribution to it and to the uh, university and the College of Education in particular. And so we're very proud and pleased for that and we want to really, really, really thank you for that. Now, I can't leave without saying that you have an opportunity to match Marjorie's enthusiasm. At your table, you can help us grow the fund by picking up your program and turning it to the backside. And on the backside, there's an indication about how you can give. And you can give right now by going to the website at ced.ncsu.edu slash give. Or you can use the so-called QR code that you can take your phone, I suppose, and get on and be able to donate. And I'll say something that sounds a little bit rustic, perhaps, or old-timey, but you can actually write us a check. <laughs> In any case, the kind of support that was given to both Whitney and Karama are the kind of things that we want to continue in our efforts to make it known that NC State prides its role in advancing equity and diversity, not only in the state, not only in the nation, but in the world. And your contribution to bringing thought leaders up before us is a very important contribution in that regard. I am pleased to announce that we are in conversations with Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings to be a speaker for next year. So many of you will know her by her outstanding reputation. And to the point that Dr. Moore has made, I know for a fact she does a lot of work in STEM education and I'm in math education. And I know that she got involved in this field because when her boys were in school, she encountered, like your wife must have encountered, some type of opposition that she thought she had to attend to. And she grew in a research area that did just that. So I want to thank everybody for coming out. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank the steering committee for helping us in this effort. Let me name them by name again. They stood, but I don't know if each individual had this name read, so I want to do that, because you know how professors are. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Uh, Dr. Mark Grimmett, please stand, yeah, <laughs> on the steering committee. Dr. William Harvey, please stand. He may be slow to stand, because he's old. Dr. Vanetta Lee, and she may have gone because she said she had class. She's doing online uh, uh, class tonight. Dr. Linda McKay-Smith. <laughs> Dr. Nona Smith-Williams, who I think she also had an engagement. She was here earlier. And of course, Lee Stiff, myself. And none of this could have been done without the support and the constant uh, attention to the details if it hadn't been for my administrative executive ex assistant, Mary Morris and Cherry, Cherry Creighton. Cherry probably went out of the room because she's very modest. She told me I shouldn't mention her name. And of course, I will say uh, again that Dr. Linda McKay Smith was very instrumental to me in helping us pull all of this together in addition to all the things that the advisory committee did. So thank you very much. Now, unlike many professors, I know when to stop talking. <laughs> Have a good evening. <laughs>